Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us on air and online. I'm Brianna Venosi in for Mary Alice Williams. A reminder, our studio remains closed, but we will be here every day to bring you the latest news and information. That format is obviously going to look a little different over the coming weeks. We're also working remotely and from our homes to follow COVID-19 guidelines. Well, cases of the novel coronavirus are increasing at a steep curve, just as state leaders expected. That was the update today with reports of 162 new cases of COVID-19, putting our total at 427 with five deaths. These cases are now in at least 17 out of 21 counties here in New Jersey. And today, President Trump declared FEMA is activated and operating at level one. That's the highest level in an effort to get help to states. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf will join the tri-state's regional approach to fighting the spread of coronavirus. Meanwhile, Governor Murphy didn't announce new social distancing measures today, but said he's not ruling out more restrictions in the future. Here's what the governor had to say in direct response to the letter that I sent President Trump yesterday. In fact, we got an initial email reply Dan Kelly got last night, I think at around 11 o'clock. I had a conversation this morning with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the person of Major General Jeff Milhorn and his team. Uh, General Milhorn will be coming here to Trenton tomorrow for a meeting with me and my team to see how the Corps can help us build out plans for expanding New Jersey's hospital capacity. Uh, Judy could give you a little bit of a sense of what that looks like. Pat Callahan and Dan Kelly have each been up to their eyeballs in that. <clears throat> Again, I thank the Trump administration for their swift response to our request. <clears throat> it has been and will continue to be <clears throat> a busy day. In, in addition to speaking with the Army Corps, we had a very constructive call with our congressional uh, delegation from both sides of the aisle. We went through what, uh, what the reality of the coronavirus was in New Jersey, which obviously they know, but we went into detail, steps we've taken, uh, help that we still need from the federal government, in, in particular in terms of equipment and things like the Army Corps, FEMA, which has been very involved with us this week, uh, and also the likely financial impact. I don't have a number for you, but you can't do what we have done and not have a dramatic, and I would use the word dramatic impact on not just people's lives, we're seeing that for sure, but also on the health of the state's budget uh, and on the state's uh, revenues. So we talked with the congressional delegation <clears throat> about things like getting flexible block grants as fast and as soon as possible. That is the singular fastest and best way for us to shore up our finances grants and forgivable loans, which are modeled after the Sandy Essential Services grants and or community disaster loans, again, which Dan Kelly ran, CDBG or other programs to fund loans and grants in addition to the proposed SBA program, operating subsidy funds for bus and rail transit. You can imagine the impact that this is having on NJ Transit uh, uh, as it is uh, on the MTA in New York, et cetera. And then lastly, but just as importantly, real relief at the individual level, particularly for those who are struggling and who need help the most. Things like lowering eligibility thresholds for SNAP or food stamps and free and reduced price lunch student benefits to ensure that more people can access the programs as well as more flexibility to when the benefits are received to reduce pressure to go to grocery stores and reimbursement for emergency child grants. I could go on, but the block grants are a number one in terms of what we need to uh, shore up our finances. Again, an excellent call. Uh, the delegation has been extraordinary on both sides of the aisle. One example, 
earlier today, Congressman Donald Payne and I spoke. He serves on the uh, Homeland Security and Preparedness Committee in the House. He chairs uh, the, the subcommittee, which oversees FEMA activities. FEMA Region 2 has been working hand in glove with Colonel Callahan and his people to set up some testing sites, among other things. Uh, the congressman and the colonel had a great conversation, which will bear fruit. Um, uh, Judy and I and others will also be on a call later today, a combination of CEOs of big health care systems on the one hand and union representatives of our health care workers on the other hand to try, try to iron out some of the challenges inevitably uh, that we're going to be facing with, uh, with something of this scale, you know, getting more consistency uh, across the health care systems, uh, making sure there's consistency in things like training, obviously personal protective equipment, uh, daycare, uh, how can we redeploy folks from other walks of life into help, et cetera. <clears throat> and I am uh, additionally having a call with representatives of the, educa of the educator community to just to walk through um, the, the reality of the, of the coronavirus situation in the state, how we got to the decision we got to in terms of closing schools um, and, you know, where we see the road headed. So lots going on. I want to reiterate that all, and you all know this, but I want to repeat it, that all events of 50 or more persons are canceled as a matter of protecting public health. I've ordered this not just for some, but for all events. And that includes a concern I have, and I can speak on behalf of Pat and law enforcement up and down the state. We don't want events to go underground uh, into people's homes. Uh, if people are gathering in large numbers, we don't care where they're gathering. It's a public health concern. Uh, and we will enforce this aggressively uh, over the coming days and weeks, if need be. We need everyone to take personal responsibility to do their part to flatten the curve. Again, a lot of what you're going to continue to hear about over here, aggressive, proactive, tough measures to flatten that curve. You could see by today's positive tests, we're not there yet by a long shot, uh, which will over here lessen the burden on the health care system and hopefully save lives and keep more people healthy. And for anyone who's unhappy about the aggressive social distancing measures, Governor Murphy says tough. He said he takes personal responsibility for the public health and safety of New Jersey and asked everyone to get on board with doing their part to stop the spread. We learned today from the state health commissioner, capacity inside the state's hospitals is already reaching a breaking point. State health officials are exploring options to create more space for patients, including opening up previously closed hospitals or even sections of them and putting out a call to all nurses with active and inactive licenses for help. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan takes us inside the plan to ease the burden. Overall, what we're looking at is a demand that so far exceeds capacity. Professor Sarah Allred's study for Rutgers Rand Institute predicts a flood of coronavirus patients could overwhelm New Jersey's 71 hospitals like Holy Name, which sits at the epicenter of Bergen County's outbreak. In Allred's worst case scenario, more than 300,000 people would not get a hospital bed if the virus spreads unchecked across New Jersey. Suggesting that um, there will be six to 17 people who need a bed for every bed that's available. And as cases increase, we know the pressure on the hospital system grows exponentially. New Jersey's got 2,000 available critical care beds, but the Department of Health predicts it'll need 2,000 more, 10 percent of them requiring ventilators just within the next couple of weeks, according to Governor Murphy. He sent an urgent letter to the president warning doctors and health care employees in New Jersey may be forced to make the agonizing decisions that the world has seen in northern Italy. They will have no choice but to deny life-saving care, including ventilators, to those in need of it. Murphy asked for help and today said the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers replied immediately and will meet to discuss expanding hospital capacity here. New Jersey's health commissioner is pushing to quickly retrofit closed hospital facilities. The department is talking with several CEOs about the possibility of opening up eight currently closed acute care hospitals 
that have been closed within the past several years. Persicelli said today 260 extra beds can be brought online now with an extra 227 more in the next few weeks and in Spira and Woodbury could add an extra 300. One hospital in northern Jersey could make a quick turnaround according to the hospital association's CEO. And it brings uh, 40 beds together with it. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is to look, um, as the commissioner said, at hospitals that have recently closed. Um, and that you know opens the door for things like um, Inspira's uh, facility down in Woodbury, for example. But hospital executives warn they'll need more frontline health care workers to staff those extra rooms. And they'll need more personal protective gear, a supply pipeline that's currently close to empty. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. At the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak in Teaneck, many local businesses are being forced to close. Others are drastically rethinking day-to-day -day operations. As Michael Hill explains, conflicting messages and mandates from the local, state and federal levels are making it even harder to plan. If I can't open, um, then I definitely see myself going out of business. Daycare owner Samantha Saltuba St. Pri calls it reality amid conflicting CDC, New Jersey, Bergen County, and Teaneck messages. The issue, whether her daycare can practice social distancing. You can actually practice social distancing by having one child work with an individual activity over here. You can have another child working at the table, even one end of the table and the other is a six foot distance. In the meantime, Creative Montessori is among the dozens of Teaneck businesses shuttered. Over the weekend, the city manager ordered a voluntary self-quarantine of 41,000 residents and limited grocery stores to 50 customers at a time. I realize the impact some of these decisions will have in the community, and I stand by them. They are not being made to alarm our community, but will further serve to safeguard our residents from the spread of the virus. I can't stress it enough, these actions will help save lives. The Bergen County Executive has ordered the shuttering of more businesses than the governor, going beyond shopping malls and theaters. He says he's been threatened with lawsuits over his Sunday blue law type restrictions. I have the moral authority. Tedesco said there are programs to help businesses financially. I can deal with the financial piece at the end. I don't want them dealing with having to bury one of their workers. Saldaba St. Pri questioned him about her hourly workers, some who live paycheck to paycheck. How would they pay for food and get by? NJTV News pressed him for answers. I don't have all the answers, but if I don't do something today, more people are going to die. How are those people going to live? And yes, there might be relief in the long run, but what's happening immediately for those people? What, are, what, are they, what do they do? right now. Saltibo St. Pri is trying to find a way to pay her hourly workers to avoid looming hardship. The Bergen County Sheriff has suspended all evictions in the county and Washington is moving at warp speed to try to give cash payments to families and hundreds of billions of dollars to businesses. All of it to try to prevent financial ruin from becoming another casualty of the COVID-19 pandemic. In TNN, Michael Hill, NJTV News. As the economic impact of the coronavirus becomes more clear, people struggling with poverty, addiction, or mental illness will be the first to feel the effects. And many of New Jersey's nonprofits are reaching their limits as they try to help already struggling communities facing more uncertainty. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports from Patterson. When it comes to the coronavirus, there's vulnerable and then there's vulnerable. While some of us may be concerned about running out of staples from the grocery store, uh, hand sanitizer or even toilet paper, there are some of us who are worried about where their next meal is coming from. And that's why a place like Eva's Village comes into really critical use. We're joined now by Dan Rinaldo, who is the CEO here. We are outdoors and that's not the usual here. No, no. Uh, we normally have three to 400 people in the community, the working poor and the homeless, eating in our community kitchen. That's obviously not safe. We've got to keep our social distance. We're following the CDC and the governor's recommendation. So we've established a takeout service. Tell us what the reaction has been from the people that you service here, because not only do you feed people, but you house people here as well. We're getting a lot of thank yous, our team, for, for continuing the service. They know what's going on. They feel the anxiety we all feel. And so there's a lot of appreciation. 
All right, we're going to go inside and take a look at uh, how everything is going and what preparations are underway. So Dave Bine is the uh -huh. chef here. This is going to be normal for the foreseeable future. For the foreseeable yeah? future, this is going to be normal. We're still maintaining our lunch service, which is the twice a day service. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to feed uh, upwards of uh, probably between 400 and 500 people per day. It's a change, but it's a, it's so far it's been a welcome change as opposed to the more drastic option of having to, you know, suspend service altogether. Mayor, when it comes to institutions in the city of Patterson, uh, Eva's Village is one. How critical are they? And and. What can the city do to help them yeah. with their operations? So you've seen Eva's Village evolve from Eva's Kitchen, which was founded over 40 years ago. And they're essentially what we're attempting to do here to help the homeless. Because government doesn't always have the solutions. That's why we look to our nonprofit partners to assist us in providing relief for those that need it the most. On most days, this line could extend around the corner and number from three to 500 people. That's business as usual at Eva's Village. But business as usual is out the window. And Dan tells us that within just a couple of weeks, this line could end up numbering over a thousand. We're in Patterson, I'm David Cruz and JTV News. State and federal leaders are reminding everyone to stay calm during this process, not a time to panic. But as we know, that's easier said than done. So we asked Rutgers psychology professor, Andrew Abeda for some tips. So people are anxious and panicked. They're going into urgent modes, panic buying, withdrawing money from banks right now. Why? Why are they doing this? Well, I argue in my research that people have this fundamental need to maintain a sense uh, of meaning in life, uh, that their lives are meaningful and have purpose. And so I, I think that one of the reasons why people are going into this panic mode is because the, the current situation we're facing is challenging many of the things that people find meaningful. Uh, for example, uh, we, my colleagues and I recently did a study where we asked people, you know, what makes your life feel meaningful? And the number one response was social relationships, family and friends. And oh. so I think we're, we're worried about our families and friends. Of course. I mean, so then how do people maintain that sense of normalcy and routine and meaning when everything's being disrupted right now? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is to uh, maintain contact and connection with other people. It's very difficult because you know, we have these mandates about social dis distancing, but I think it's a good time to prioritize, find safe ways to connect with others, whether that's through chat, video chat, phone calls, text messages, things like that. So what are some tools people can use to help cope with isolation right now? I think it's important to, to really prioritize connecting with others, family and friends, uh, reaching out via text messaging, phone, uh, video chat, uh, so that we don't feel so alone during these times. Another thing that people can do is, is go outside their homes, go out and connect with nature is another way to feel less alone. Yeah, certainly. If we keep that distance, we can go outside. Okay, Rutgers uh, psychology professor Andrew Beta, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Restaurant and bar owners are trying to get creative. Now that Governor Murphy's executive order is in effect, the businesses are trying to figure out a way to stay afloat. Raven Santana takes us inside one restaurant's effort to keep going. No one's getting paid now. There's no way anyone can afford to continue paying all the, client, the workers without having any income. Luis Perez is the owner of 1958 Cuban Cuisine in Westfield. The restaurant that is usually jam-packed with patrons hoping to get a table was completely empty, like many other restaurants and businesses in town. For anyone who's coming to Westfield, it's... It's close. That's because on Monday evening, the state officially required all restaurants and retail to provide delivery or curbside pickup only in an effort to mitigate the spread of coronavirus. Mary Lou Halverson, president of the New Jersey Restaurant and Hospitality Association, says restaurants everywhere are grappling with how to survive and take care of their employees in this sudden new reality. It was a 90 percent layoff on Monday night of restaurant employees. Um, those that choose to do delivery or takeout will retain some of their back of house. Um, this goes for four weeks. 45 percent of independent businesses may not reopen. I had already informed them last week and I hope some of them apply online for unemployment. We have 
some here, but it's really hard to even know what we can have, you know, so we're, it's a day by day process, you know. It's, things are beginning to get scarce. I mean, uh, I think that the distributor told me that they're out of chicken. Perez says the goal is now trying to remain creative and optimistic, and he says that starts in the kitchen. I have an idea, maybe like a, do a, a menu, like a, like a package, like, you know, get this, this, and this for the family of six and have a special pricing for them. Everything is going to change day by day. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I have to be fast enough to change the rules and what I'm doing to survive. Perez says in addition to ordering from local restaurants, people can also help out by making sure to tip a little extra when they receive their delivery. In Westfield, Raven Santana, NJTV News. The state legislature is poised to step up aid to families and businesses hardest hit by the coronavirus. Rhonda Schaffler is here with more details. Bree, we've been focused on talks underway in Washington to try to boost the U.S. economy, but there are lots of efforts underway here to help New Jersey businesses and workers. Tomorrow, the state Senate is expected to vote on a package of legislation. One bill would provide payment to workers who lose their jobs during this crisis if they do not have paid leave. We learned yesterday that in a single day, 15,000 New Jersey workers filed for unemployment benefits. Another bill would allow Governor Murphy to issue an executive order holding evictions and foreclosures during a state of emergency. And another bill would extend a state tax filing deadline if the federal government does the same. We did learn yesterday from Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin that taxpayers don't have to pay any taxes owed to the IRS until July 15th. Penalties and interest would be waived. That likely means taxpayers would file for an extension. The NJCPA says it will provide updates when the IRS confirms specifics on this. Meantime, the state continues to go after businesses that are price gouging. The state attorney general's office says the state has issued 13 subpoenas and has sent warning letters to 80 companies suspected of illegally raising prices. An update now on what the pharmaceutical industry is doing in response to fighting COVID-19. The FDA has approved more commercial tests. The Trump administration expects more than 2 million tests will be available next week. Turning to Wall Street, more deep selling today. Another trading halt. New Jersey financial advisor Timothy Spee says this is such an uncertain time for investors. They want guidance. They want to be able to make decisions. And right now, it's very difficult to make decisions. It's really a day-by-day -day environment as far as decision-making. And that's very unsettling. President Trump said earlier the economy may be heading into a recession, but he doesn't agree with comments made by his Treasury Secretary that the unemployment rate could spike to 20%. Now let's look at the selling that occurred on Wall Street this afternoon. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by the New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters. Its annual Broker Focus Conference comes to Harrods in Atlantic City, April 27th through the 29th. Event details online at njahu.org. If you have any questions or concerns about the coronavirus, its symptoms or how to treat it, you can call New Jersey's coronavirus hotline. The number's on your screen, 1-800-222-1222 or text NJCOVID to 898-211. And you can find all the latest reporting and resources for tackling the coronavirus, like fact sheets, a list of symptoms and phone numbers to call on a special section of our website. Just head to njtvnews.org slash coronavirus for updated information. And as you heard the governor today, everyone has a role to play in this. Ours will be right here. We continue to keep you updated online at njtvnews.org. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire team at NJTV News, thank you for being here. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. 
We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. I'm Kayla, and this is what I work for, to teach him, to protect her, and to take care of me, too. I need health insurance that does the same, that makes things easier for my schedule, so I can focus on what matters. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me, and him, and her. The Orsted Vision is a world that runs entirely on green energy. Located off the coast of Atlantic City, Orsted's Ocean Wind Project will provide renewable offshore wind energy. Jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey.